doing things on a shoestring, but you know, he could train guys and, and it was successful and it was also in my hometown and I knew it could be more successful. So I went to Jim Ross and I said, you know, it's only a matter of time because I've run through a number of things here that they have me doing and for one reason or another, either, you know, me and Vince Russo butted heads in the creative thing and me and Kevin Dunn butted heads on the TV thing and also one of these days I'm going to prison because I live in Connecticut and somebody, I'm going to flip. How about if I move back to Louisville and we start an official developmental territory? Because they've been sending guys to Memphis to, you know, to work for Lawler, to work for Randy Hales, but they were only running three shows uh, a week or so in the live TV, and there was no place for guys to go to school there. It wasn't full service. So anyway, I said I would go back to Louisville and work with Danny, and we would contract because I bought a piece of OBW, quite frankly, you know, because I wanted to promote wrestling in my hometown and live there. And we contracted with the WWE to serve as, as a developmental program. We would take guys and we would give them experience on live events and on doing television and, and also a, a, a school where they could actually train. And, you know, that, would, that way we could replenish, restock the shelves because when the territories went away, the, the, the training ground went away. And you had an inexperienced talent. Guys were getting hurt. Guys weren't ready for prime time, whatever the case. Mm -hmm. Let's start this now because in five years we're really going to need it. That's what I said in 1999. Well, we started it. And with Jim Ross, who understood wrestling and who understood how to relate. I'll tell you a story that Bill Watts told me that illustrates how Jim Ross would work with you. <laughs> Bill Watts said that Vince McMahon Sr., back in the 70s, 80s, if he wanted, let's say, you know, Bill Watts' top heel was Waldo Von Erich. If he wanted Waldo Von Erich... Vince Sr. was going to get Waldo Von Eric because the Northeast, Madison Square Garden, he could pay guys more money than they would make in most other territories. So if he wanted a guy, a guy was going to go. But at the same time, he didn't just rape every territory of talent, which his son would have followed suit. Um, what he would do is he'd call Bill Watts. He'd say, Bill, I really need Waldo uh, starting TV on September 20th. Can you make him available for me? Well, of course, Vince. I'd be, be glad to. Thank you, Bill. I'll give you an extra week of dates on Andre. Andre, man, sure. And then there's a week of sellouts in the territory. So it was, you worked together. Jim Ross understood that we were running our own business and that we had to sell tickets and we had to make some money to pay the bills and keep the thing going so that we could contract WWE F for this training service and develop these guys. So he would give us a few weeks' notice if somebody was going to be called up or if somebody was going to start going on the road or if somebody was being sent down that we need to take a look at. He had his shit together. Um, it was very easy to book talent with Jim Ross because if Jim Ross said that somebody was going to be there, they were there. Mm. Even if the WWE had to go to expense to get out of something that they had gotten into because they'd promised, they'd given their word. Uh, we ran between summer of 2000 and summer of 2001 three shows at the Louisville Gardens that drew a combined over 11,000 fans paid and over $150,000 at the gate. Mm. We partnered with Clear Channel Radio. We had sponsors. Uh, the, the sellout, the Christmas Chaos Show 2001, which was actually the show so nice we had to promote it twice. We had a date booked December 13, 2000. Snowstorm came. Nobody could get there. We postponed it until January 31st. Same card and still sold out. Everybody kept mm -hmm. their tickets. Nobody got refunds. More people came. Anyway, wow. we paid Steve Austin $25,000 to come down and do a live interview with Jim Ross. And Kane was the main event against the Leviathan, who was Batista, because uh, we trained in that period of time, Batista, Randy Orton, John Cena, etc. Um, we were successful local promotion. We weren't going to get any bigger, didn't want to get any bigger. We wanted to do just what we were doing and get our sponsors locally and draw houses. So Jim Ross would book these guys and we would pay them well to come down. And, and then also it was a place where Jim Ross could say, you need to lose weight, or you just got out of the hospital from surgery, you need to get back in shape, or you need to get your wind back, or we need to take a look at you. Then they'd come to Louisville and work for us for free because it was helping OVW, but it was also helping the WWE, and it was helping the guy that came down and did that. And they'd stay on the payroll in Connecticut. <laughs> they would stay on the payroll. They were paying them, but, you know, we, we paid guys when we featured them and made money off of them, or when we were providing the service that we contracted to with the WWE, they were sent down to work for us, mm -hmm. and they were paying them. But we worked together. It was all kinds of different ways you could do things. When JR started slowing down and deciding to move back to Oklahoma and they started grooming, like grooming a werewolf, to groom John Laurinaitis for JR's spot, he couldn't hold his jock, so now he's walking in his shoes. 
Lord, I just didn't know what the fuck he was doing. And I'm sorry, John, you know you're a complete fucking idiot, and you're a liar. You know, he would... Then, then we, we start... Uh, the thing is... Does anyone like him? No, not in the world. I, no, his, his, I actually, haven't met anyone. His, 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 own, his own mother slapped the stork that delivered him. Um, they, would take, they would take guys, uh, and they would fire him out from under us. They'd be working for us. We'd have championship belts on them, and one day they wouldn't show up, and we'd get a call from the office. Oh, we had to let them go. Well, are they going to come back to finish up? Oh, no. Once we fire them, we give them their notice. We, we don't let them work anymore because if they get hurt, then we got to pay them until they're well because we can't fire people that are injured. So they wouldn't even give us the call saying, hey, you better you know, wind so-and-so up because he might not be around too long. They'd just fire people, and we'd never see them again. Or they would send guys to us. They'd call us up on Tuesday. Yeah, we're sending so-and-so tomorrow for television. Oh, we need you to use them on TV. I can't. TV's written. Well, stick them in. I can't stick them in. I've had the fucking show written. What do you, I do this myself. What do you think? we got a fucking crew down here that re-racks all this shit on spur-of-the-moment notice. Why didn't you call me two weeks ago? They didn't know two weeks ago because they didn't have their shit together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or one time we were promoting a show at Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom with Randy Orton, who we had on paper from John Laurinaitis, was supposed to be there uh, on that date. And Tommy Dreamer calls us and says, well, he ain't going to be there. He bought a, a non-refundable vacation for his family. Well, why did he do that? Well, I don't think John ever told him. Then Laurinaitis says, oh, no, it was Dreamer. Dreamer didn't tell him. And Dreamer says, no, that's bullshit. <laughs> Laurinaitis is the one that was supposed to tell him because Laurinaitis is the head of this fucking bowl of fruits and nuts. You, you didn't know who to believe. You just pretty well knew not to believe John Laurinaitis. And well, I'll tell you a story. I went to Doug Basham. Here's another guy that they fucked and mind raped and ran out of the business. That could have been a great talent. <clears throat> he looked great. His, his physique was tremendous. He was an old time worker. He could talk. He was really getting it. He had seven years experience in the business. I'm using him as my top heel. Danny Davis's nephew. And, and so he was his Danny's first student, and Danny had really taken care. I'm not saying nepotism. I'm saying Danny really took care of training him because he was family, and he was good. He was real good. Mm. He's my top heel. He's got long hair, and he's cocky, and he's wearing the black leather pants. He's, got, he's ripped, and he's great, right? He walks in TV one night. He's bald-headed. He looked like a 40-year-old truck driver. I said, well, what the fuck did you do? He said, well, I was at, you know, they had me come to Raw, and... Creative wanted to see what I looked like bald. I said, they can't just fucking pretend. So I, I get on a phone, I call Laurinaitis for his voicemail. It's John Laurinaitis, it's Jim Cornette. My top heel just walked into fucking television, looks like a 40-year-old truck driver. Would you please tell this alleged creative team that if they can't fucking pretend or imagine what a guy looks like bald, give me two weeks' notice, I'll book him in a hair match, I'll shave it, and I'll sell some tickets. Thank you, fuck you, bye. Boom. It was constant. It was, they, they slapped us in the face, they disrespected us. We had trained close to a hundred people who made the full-time roster. Guys and girls, to some extent, either started in OVW, were signed, and I mean, we found them, and then they signed them after we trained them, or they were signed by WWF and sent down there and we trained them, or they were already in the business, but they spent some time getting polished before they went there. No other developmental program that they ever had lasted a year. No other developmental program they ever had did anything but leech off a, and I'm not, no, I tell, I tell a lie, leech, except for Les Thatcher, <laughs> in Cincinnati, everybody else leached off of them, took their money, never made any money of their own, never had a real promotion, Pinocchio, and never produced any talent, but yet there we were, and they're going, ding, ding. They used us like a storage closet. Down to they sent us rings we didn't ask for, because they wanted us to have WWF rings, including the WWF ropes, which are real ropes. We said no. Somebody's going to get hurt. We use cables because we use the ring in the gym every day. We'll send you extra ropes. So immediately, within two weeks, I think it was Mark Henry. Of course, he's so heavy. He hits the ropes. They break. He hurts himself. Three guys got hurt on the WWF equipment that they had to have because we couldn't just use cables instead of ropes. They were telling us what brand of Snapple to sell in the concession stand. Oh, don't do business with this guy. We're mad at him. Well, I'm not. He wants to give me money. That don't make me mad. Well, don't do business with him. Are you going to give me the money he was? Oh, we can't do that. Yes, for more money, they'd squeal like a pig under a gate. So you would just as People think... As Wait a minute. Uh, hold on. Hold on. God damn it. Go ahead. People think that the WWE owned OVW or started OVW or purchased OVW or paid all our bills. I figured it out one time. 
At the time that I figured it out, they accounted for 30% of our annual operating revenue. Not counting profit, just annual operating revenue because we sold merchandise. We had sponsors. We ran 120 live events in the course of one year. Not in front of tons of people, some of them, but counting the church gyms and the flea markets, we had our guys out in front of people. We ran the Louisville Gardens, we ran Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom, we ran St. Teresa's Gym in front of 62 people. But we were running the shows. We had a television show that was not bumped, preempted, or fucked with by our full cable coverage broadcast affiliate CW Network Station in Louisville from May 2000 to May 2008. Saturday night at 11 p.m., never been touched. We were doing two-hour primetime specials on Saturday night leading up to our Louisville Gardens events or for our anniversary shows. We had a real company, and we, had, we wanted some respect. Give us notice when you're taking somebody. Give us notice when you're sending somebody. And leave us the fuck alone to what kind of equipment we want to use because obviously we're doing a good job. And John Laurinaitis is a fucking moron, and he couldn't leave well enough alone. And for the last year that I had a relationship with him, like this, I'd call up and yell. He'd call up, Jim, you can't do that. It's a publicly traded company. My response would be, we're not even a privately traded company. We're trying to make some money down here. Leave us fuck alone. I yelled at the guy and called him a stupid son of a bitch because he's fucking with my business. Well, you hurt his feelings. He shouldn't have such soft fucking feelings. He's in the wrestling business. And on and on it went until finally, boom, 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 we agreed not to speak to each other anymore, ever, for the rest of our lives. Now that I got that out of my system, well, I said, so the question was, uh, hold on, let me tell you. about WCW, I don't know. No, the, the, que the question was, yeah. I wanted to know no, what no, the creative it, was. Well, wait a minute, in yeah. developmental, there was a question down here. Was it a hassle being a booker in a developmental territory? No, box of fluffy ducks. <laughs> so anyway.